Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 15 of Experience AV. Today, we are going to be talking about So You Have All That Data, Now What? Uh, before we get into it, though, I'm Jim Maltese. With me as ever is Jeremy Elsesser. And for the third time in a row, baby, Mr. Frederick Laux. Good to see you again, man. How are things? Beautiful. The weather is gorgeous today. Idaho has finally decided that it's spring slash summer instead of winter slash spring. So we have <laughs> jumped to warm, beautiful weather. So I'm I am very happy. Very good. Very good. Mr. L says, what's been new with you? Oh, not much, man. Really just, uh, you know, it's it's crazy how it goes from I'm going to Infocom later this year to I'm going to Infocom on Friday. So, you know, uh, studying up, getting prepared for the classes, excited, 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 kind of getting that that jittery feeling of excitement to, to see all the friends that we haven't seen in a long time. Yes. Uh, weather's getting warmer here in summer in Arizona, and I uh, I still can't believe we convinced Fred to come back for a third a third showing. So yeah, Mister oh. Mister Lauks, again, thanks for joining us. I hope everybody has their beverage of choice as we yes, very much so as we take the opportunity to further explore these topics before we. Uh, go explore this some explore them some more at infocom man so yeah. yeah doing great jim how about you man how's life Good. life is great i i am freaking out because not only does the pre-show at infocom so those three-day classes start on saturday it's a short week so i keep on thinking it's tuesday i'm all jacked up maybe i'm skipping to thursday i have no idea what day it is not only that this saturday we are talking to the astronauts on the space station over amateur radio. So I've been putting that together and like, I've been, <laughs> it's just like the perfect storm of events, but all every single event is so exciting and so cool. And I am, I'm pumped. But after Infocom, I, I think I'm going to just kind of sleep for a weekend. I was going to say, you're going to come down off of that and just be drained into the yeah. negative. Big, you're going to so do good. that before you even make it to Infocom. You get to talk to the astronauts. Dude, oh, I'm, cool. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. And, and you know, like as excited as I am, just, just for like the, the geek aspect of it, I watched a few of them, uh, a, a few samples. It, it's the ARIS program. I encourage you to check it out. It's amateur radio on the International Space Station. It's a, a program put on by by NASA, and and actually it's international. So um, uh, European, Japan, Russia, you know, all, all the different countries uh, have a similar program. But what caught me off guard is how emotional it is and uh me and and my fellow committee people were saying i, th I think we're all going to be blubbering up on stage when you just when you make that first contact it's like you you hear the crackle of the radio and then you hear anyone ss you know it's, that's the the call sign of the space station we we hear you we're ready for your questions and oh it's goosebumps it's, goosebumps it's so good it's so good so that's saturday i'm 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 stoked i'm uh now, yeah, this is for your group, everything. right? This is for your, uh, let me get this correct. I think it's just Scout Troop now, right? Yes. Yeah. Scouts BSA. That's what it is. So it, we're, we're doing it for the district. So my daughter's Cub Scout Troop, my son's Boy Scout Troop, and a whole bunch of other troops of, of around the my county are, are going to be there. I think there's going to be like, like 600 people in attendance. It, it should be pretty dope just celebrating wow. STEM talking to astronauts it's mm, it, uh, it's going to be so are, good are the kids anywhere near as excited as you are about this <laughs> it's close i see a few of them we had a uh, we, we have practice zoom where we just went through because you have 10 minutes you have that 10 minute window which just amps the energy and so you've got to make sure the kids are on point they're they're moving they're flowing they know their questions that they're going to ask and everything's got to be perfect because you only have that 10 minute window and uh, I, I saw a few of the kids like bouncing when I, I gave them a little spiel about who we're going to be talking to, Dr. Chell Lindgren. And, uh, and I, I showed them a few videos and a few pictures of, of this is this is what we're going to be talking to. This is how we're going to do it. And you just kind of see them like bouncing a little bit in the Zoom. It was, <laughs> it was really good. <laughs> but Thank yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about it as well. <laughs> so 
I don't Should care who cool. you are, man. I think everybody wants to be an astronaut when they're a kid until they <laughs> until they get beyond yes. the I want to be an astronaut phase. Man, that is that is pretty exciting. Have yeah. a great time with that. Yeah, dude. I'm looking forward to it. Wow. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. So before we kick off the topic, remind me, guys, what what are what sessions are you holding at Infocom? And let's 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 start Good. with the Level guest. Seven. Mr. Laux, what mm. what are you uh, what are you presenting on? Yeah, what, what... so I'm going to be talking about uh, monitoring meeting rooms. Very exciting stuff. Uh, so monitoring meeting rooms and the painful uh, journey to a single pane of glass. So uh, yeah, should be really fun. It's going to be Thursday morning at eight thirty. Uh, so. Hopefully some of you wake up by then and, and come join us to talk about monitoring for whatever reason. Uh, you know, must be a glutton for punishment if you want to be out there that early, but I would love to have you in the room and, and talk about it. And it isn't going to be streamed or anything uh, or recorded. So it's a topic for another day. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to redo it as well. So if you miss it, you're not coming to Infocom or you're not able to do it. Nice. I'm just going to do it again in this right. kind of format uh, and maybe even maybe even do some commentary. I don't know. We'll do like Mystery Science Theater style or something like that. So, oh, nice. um, yeah, that's a really smart idea. I, I, I yeah, always thinking. <laughs> I, I, yeah. That's awesome. Maybe, maybe we can have a follow up conversation to the show as to why it wasn't recorded and streamed. Like I'm, I'm, I have some a questions few, about that, so I'm interested. Yeah, a to few learn. years ago they they did, they did, but I, I don't know what happened. They they probably some type of IP conversation, who owned what, and but but they they did record a few sessions before on a professional crew. They they shared like the the HD video as a as a handheld camera. It was really well done, but it might be resources, might be cost. I, yeah, I don't know. I'll be interested. I'm I'm definitely looking forward to asking a few people. So yeah. Fred, that's exciting, man. Thank you. I, I know our last session conversation was about just that topic, monitoring. And then, you know, today is a great conversation about, you know, what to do with the data after you collect it. So um very yeah, related. Post, post monitoring. <laughs> well, one of my favorite things that you just tried to do was downplay how cool monitoring and data is. You're like, ooh, it's so exciting. Like like you can't be as passionate and nerdy about monitoring and then try to downplay it <laughs> like it's not the thing you totally like beating your head against the wall for. So um, <laughs> I just got to say for anybody who's listening, if you're if you're thinking about monitoring your AV systems, changing your monitoring platform and you want to talk to somebody who's uh, banged their their head against that proverbial wall, uh, Fred, your guy not to be missed. And I'm excited that we're going to take this forward beyond infocom yeah. jim what are you uh what are you up to this year man so uh on well i'll be late because i'll be talking to freaking astronauts on saturday but come sunday i'll be teaching ctsd with the powerful bill natris um mm. that's mm. saturday monday uh, sunday monday then on tuesday uh, I'll be taking on creating a consistent AV user experience at scale where we're going to be talking about largely program uh, program management, quality management offerings that that especially large enterprise clients should be considering. Any size client should be considering, but it uh, it will just bring that much more return on investment at, at that enterprise level. Um, and on Wednesday, I'll be giving a short talk on the show floor at i believe 3 2 30 uh about funny enough av analytics um but but how about you my friend what what, what are you doing there you just sleeping and eating bonbons or, or or what you know i really should maybe do a infocom that is sleeping and eating bonbons <laughs> i've never quite had that experience it's always <laughs> just go to the max <laughs> Yeah, so joining in on the three-day education sessions prior to the show starting, and I don't get to freaking talk to astronauts on Saturday, so I'll be there on Friday, and teaching NAVs, Network AV Systems, uh, Network Systems for AV, with the powerful Paul Streffen. So 
uh, pretty excited to get super nerdy with a bunch of great folks and talk about, you know, bending networks of our clients and our, our AV systems to our AV needs and will. That's uh, Friday, Saturday, no, I'm sorry, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday being a down day, which you have a you have a session on Tuesday, right, Jim? It was yeah, funny. I, 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 I was so confused because Tuesday is usually like booked with the opening ceremony and like there's other mm -hmm. events that aren't happening this year. So I was arguing with our marketing department like, no, there's nothing happening on Tuesday. And she's like, yes, <laughs> here it is right here. And she opened up the website. So I've I've been since corrected. Um, interesting. So for me, Tuesday is a down day. And then uh, the only other session that I am privileged to host this year is with you on Thursday. We are doing a co-hosted session on measuring intelligibility with Stipa. I've even got my my precious XL2 right here at my desk uh, preparing for the session. It's so pretty. We're going to get, it's my favorite tool. Um, <laughs> we're going to get fun. We're, we're going to have fun with uh, teaching folks how to measure intelligibility using the Stipa test and then have some fun uh, measuring it through face masks. You know, the the world we're living in these days, we, we had a burning question, you know, what does a face mask do to intelligibility? Does it affect your ability to understand the words that are coming out of my mouth and actually be able to put a put a number to it. So that's on Thursday mid morning. Uh, come join in some fun. It's going to be hands on. We're going to have tools. We're going to have the ability to do some of the measurements and really excited for that one. Yes. Likewise. That's going to be awesome. a fun one. A bunch of nerds. Man, we are a bunch of nerds and we got a bunch going on this year. Like yeah. there's a lot going on. Lots of representation. Hey, Jeremy, I had a question that I was I was reviewing the schedules for the three day classes. And uh, before we jump into our topic, I just had this I had this burning question. So there are like two three day AV networking classes. Like. What's the difference? I was trying to dig into it. So I know so you were talking about yours a little bit uh, and as I looked through and was trying, you know, digging into the, the roster, what I saw was that you know, we had the uh, the network AV systems course, and then networking networking technology for AV professionals. Yeah, as two separate I think courses. One is one is an introduction. Uh, I believe it's the networking for AV professionals is more of an introductory level course, um, where it's like you you know very little about about networks, and and you want to just be able to to converse with the IT department. But NAVs is the network AV systems are the legit like lab centric heavy hitters who really need to get into networking fundamentals and, and nuts and bolts um, to set up networks for, for AV systems. Gotcha. Yeah. So like, you know, uh, you know, high level introductory understanding versus more getting into the engineering, getting into the weeds of, yeah. of the technology itself. I get this. Or Jim, did we get it? Or uh, Jeremy, did we get it? The Jim I think so. It? I think so. I actually, yeah, the network AV systems, it's, it's, there's going to be some crossover between the classes for sure, mm -hmm. right? There's, there's fundamentals that you can't get away from when you're talking mm -hmm. about networking technology. And uh, the class that I'm teaching, NAVS, is going to get pretty molecular. Like we're going to be working with Wireshark, we're going to be actually inspecting packets and, you know, trying to trying to move the needle for the pros that are in the room with us uh, on their networking knowledge. Uh, I think we're going to get a number of folks that are quite versed in networks and maybe looking to fill in some gaps. I think we're going to get some quite versed network folks that are going to fill in some gaps on my side and on Paul's side. Right. That's one of the biggest benefits. So uh, but we're going to get deep into it and then we're going to get deep into um, configuration requirements at a high level for AV systems and the requirements that AV systems have on networks. So I was just looking, it looks like Gain and Gain Foster, shout out, and Caleb Nelson from yeah. Bridge Bridges is teaching the network oh, nice. technology for AV pros. Cool. So Caleb, again, I think you're I think you're gonna stay focused on concept for the network technology for AV pros. You're going to spend a day on concept with us, and then we're going to 
open up the lid to the network switches and nice. see the packets traveling nice. back and forth. Awesome. All right, I'm clear now. Hopefully, if there was anybody else who was confused like me, now you know. So perfect. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's it's almost like dovetails nicely into our topic. Now that yeah, you have big the data, what are you going to do with it? Yeah. So let's talk. I think about you should that. come it's to our easy. classes and to our sessions. Hell you yeah. know, there, there's my uh, shameless plug. So, <laughs> man. Jim, kick us off, man. Like, what, yeah, man. So, the, what what, what are we talking about today? This was the teaser. Are you ready? We have the ability to collect a lot of data about how our users use their systems. But what are we doing with all that information? Is anyone reviewing it? Is it any good? Is it valuable? Does it make sense? Deming said, "Without data, you're just another person with an opinion." Interpreting AV user analytics has the potential to be the next revolutionary AV offering. It also has the potential to elevate the AV industry. So my friends, where, where do we start? Where do we start with this topic? Man. Well, so, so maybe, maybe let's get some, maybe let's get some examples of AV analytics out there. Like, what are we talking about? If I'm a technology manager, if I'm, an integrator that is monitoring a whole bunch of systems for my clients, what type of analytics would be useful to me to do my job better? Like, yeah. I mean, that, so, so so me, that's like the whole, that's like the Holy grail question right there. Yeah. Right? Like if you can answer that. Then... Yeah. Well, so, well, I mean, so I think... let, go ahead, go ahead. Okay, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna go. So yeah. here's what I would say, like table stakes. Like, where where do you start? Certainly, you know, collecting data is, you know, we talked about that. That's a challenge. But once you have it, the first thing you can do to analyze that data is to assess health, which is what we would call monitoring. So if we, I'm just, I want to punctuate that that like just because you're getting data doesn't mean you're monitoring, right? Just because you have data doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're monitoring. Just because you're collecting it doesn't mean you're monitoring because monitoring requires uh, thresholds and alerts and services to be configured so that you have a picture of what your system looks like. So I would say kind of one thing one, right? And, and we can put a bullet on this and move it along to the, the business meet, but I want to focus on, you know, calling out that fact. Uh, the, the, the first thing you're going to do with all the data you collect is hopefully ensure your systems are doing the things they're supposed to do, or, or at least knowing something about all the, all the systems you have. From there, it's really interesting. I mean, maybe let's start with like some of the dumbest stuff, like inventory. You have a bunch of data. You have now data about the inventory of your, your, your system inventory, your hardware inventory, your endpoint inventory. What can you do with that, right? Um, you can assess warranty status based on installation date maybe right you could uh, get into one of my favorite examples is uh, if there is a manufacturing problem like a bad run and there are a string of serial numbers that uh, have an issue right you can find that because you have an inventory of that information right for the particular product um, that is only slightly less sexy than i think the one that always comes to my mind you know, very pressing for me is, uh, and I'm still focusing on hardware pretty good and we're gonna get into user experience, I'm sure, but uh, firmware versions, right? That's a huge question when you're trying to do data analytics, you're trying to look at your environment, critical CDE comes out, right? There's, there's some critical issue, you need to get a patch, whatever it is, you have to ask the question first. Like, okay, are we impacted? And can you look at your AV engineering team and say, are we impacted? And are they gonna go, let me ask my vendors, let me ask my manufacturers, or are they going to go, well, the impacted versions are this, so no, right? Or yes, and here's the 15 systems we need to isolate, or the 100 systems, or whatever. So I think there's just operational things, right? Before you even get into the business value, before you get into the, you know, the, the, the analytics of usage and real estate and all those fun things that I'm sure we're going to talk about here in a moment, there's just the basics of like, from an AV engineering administration perspective, right? You need, once you have that data, you can actually use it to run a better AV program, right? You can you can use it to run a better AV 
uh, program and be able to answer questions that are asked of you. So that's that's the first thing that kind of pops into my head is like the low level stuff, inventory information, static inventory mm -hmm, information. Mm -hmm. Very helpful for just table stakes, IT operations. Yeah. So are, Fred, are you talking at the device level or at the room level? Ideally both. Yeah. So kind of um, not just individual devices, but also logical groupings of it's devices. Kind of what I mean by service. Yeah, it's what I mean by service monitoring. So yeah, you you need to it doesn't do you any good to know you have, you know, eighteen hundred speaker phones. Um I mean, it might be helpful if you can centrally administer those to at least get bad firmware versions out, but you're not going to know which rooms to block for, for the downtime, right? Or how to coordinate that with real human activity. Uh, they could be overseas, they could be in the US, you, you wouldn't even know, right? Um, so yeah, you, you have to have some level of services. And again, I don't want to der derail too much into monitoring, but the whole point of getting a bunch of telemetry data from devices in the for the purposes of monitoring, which is purpose number one, is to be able to establish a service, right? We think services as in uh, IT services, things that we would monitor as a, as a health item. And we want to establish an, a service for the room, right? For, for a room, that is a service. It has several components. And if any of them are degraded, the service is degraded, right? So once you have that view of your room as a service, you have metadata at a room level, you have a bunch of devices or services or things that are associated with that room. Now you've got a really good understanding of, well, you know, an issue on this device actually nets an error state for the room, right? That's impacting users. Now you can track an SLA, right? Now you're getting the business. You can now sell an SLA because you can actually track an SLA on your room uptime now, right? So that would be my, I mean, that's, that's huge. That's huge. There's business value in that for integrators. You can sell against an SLA or at least measure one. Good luck doing that today. How would you even measure room up, down, right? Service availability. It's right. uh, yeah, really difficult. So can, can I challenge you on some detail mm -hmm. around that? Because I want to fully understand it for myself and I'm building this picture. Um, essentially what I heard was the idea of having health status, not only at the individual device and services that that device provides, but also having an overall health status that is associated with all of the interconnected devices in a room, let's say, that deliver on a status. Can you give me an example of like, what would be a situation where a device went to yellow status, but it didn't impact the overall room status, so to speak? Sure. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Um, so maybe you're tracking wireless microphones and their battery health. And you have a wireless microphone, one of 20 that is reporting dead. That device is in a critical state. The room is not in a critical state. That's a good right? example. Yeah. So there, there are things that are bad from a device level that are kind of fine. You know, they can be benign at a room level. And it really just depends on on the system and how it's engineered. Whereas if like, you know, the core audio processing engine is offline, you're probably going to go full red status on the, yeah, on the offline yeah. in an error state, even right. Asking the processor, are you in an error state? Yes, I am. That should be a, a warning to everybody. We need to go check this out. Things like that. So kind of back to your point, these are operational analytics. These are mm -hmm. in the moment in, you know, keeping services active, supporting, making sure that the outcomes are delivered every single second of every single day. Yeah, 100%. That's all I've talked about so far. That's why I keep saying like, we haven't got the business yet. Like this is just, no. this is just IT operations. And I, yes, IT operations, not AV operations. This is standard IT operations stuff within a larger organization. What are our where are our services? Is our is routing up, right? Is yep. you know is is Wi-Fi up across the various locations? That's the service health, right? Not everybody's monitoring it to the that level of sophistication, but if you look at cloud companies, for example, right, and you go to Zoom's status page and they have Zoom Portal, Zoom API, Zoom Rooms, Zoom whatever, CRC, those green lights, those are services. They're doing service monitoring and they're showing you that these services are active. The paradigm shift is integrators thinking about rooms as a service. I don't mean AV as a service. 
that's not the conversation. Just a room as a service that we are trying to guarantee with some level of predictability or uptime. I have to be honest. I wish there was a different word for it than service. Service monitoring. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it just, let's trademark one. <laughs> it just we do. there's so many <laughs> services in the in the world, right? Like it, it does start to feel like a little bit like there's some there's some overlap, but you're you're hundred percent right. Yeah, I mean you can always just call it the SLA, right? Just think about it as an SLA against the room. What's the uptime yep. SLA for the room? Yep. Because that's that, what we're gonna monitor. Hundred percent. Yeah. So okay, but what about non IT engineering things? What about non AV IT operational things? Unless there's well, others you got, Jim. That's where no, that's where my brain went to. As soon as you were talking about the device, I'm like, well, that's under the hood, you know, the device level stuff. But what about just user experience, right? We Zoom and Teams do a great job. Every third call or whatever, I always get that. How is your experience? Um, and so I've I've always fallen in love with this idea that how easy and powerful would it be for us to just add a two question survey to the end of a call? Someone says end call. How is your experience? One through five. And then uh, if it's less than three, what what aspect of the system gave you problems, audio, video, network, uh, or facilities? Just to gather that high level stuff, and then you can you can action off that. I mean, like you're talking like CSAT, like fundamentally at the bottom level, like customer satisfaction survey, right? Yeah, like just to start CSAT. Critical, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, you know, I'm I'm thinking I was gonna. I just smiled when you said like Teams and Zoom give us this great survey because I'm like I don't I don't know that I've ever filled that out. I don't know. I don't really? know if I've ever clicked the star button, and that's because I'm. I'm going to censor myself. That's because I'm a jerk. Yeah, you're <laughs> a rebel. And I'm busy. <laughs> I'm running around. No, so like, I'm, you know, I'm a busy guy. I don't want to pay attention to this. Unless, unless that meeting was horrible, then you're getting one that's star. It. Right. But that's what you want to know. Right. You, uh, you yeah, want to know about yeah. that ASAP. That's yeah. the Google I mean, I, review, I this... review troll right there, man. You're only yeah. going to hear from me if I have something negative to say. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I was, I was listening to the, um, to the, uh, startup hustle uh, podcast and they were talking with one of the startup owners about uh, how they were getting feature and bug reports back from their product and they just loved when their customers called in and said hey there's this problem right uh, because for every one customer that calls out and actually tells you about the problem there are 10 or 20 or more that are experiencing it and suffering in silence yeah right so that's that's great right okay so CSAT that's awesome I mean that's a standard again another standard idle uh, IT metric, right? Uh, as far as like standard IT operations goes, so that's great. Uh, we should absolutely, if we think about the room as a service, then we should ask people how satisfied they are with the service, not just the uptime, but the customer satisfaction on a yes. room by room basis, right? Or, or use, use by use, not even room by room. Oh sure. yeah, well, yeah, room well, by room basis. Trend data, data right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's customer satisfaction, and then maybe you know if there are any other like, hey, did you have any issues? Mm -hmm. Submit it here. That's more operations data coming in, but it's a great ingest. That's fascinating. See, that would be incredibly useful. And and another one of my favorites that was mentioned to me from someone who worked at a very large company that rhymes with Bicropoft was. Um, <laughs> Uh, they wanted to know how big their room should be. So, you know, the, how, how, how many rooms do I need and how big should, how, how many, what's the capacity? Um, how do I deploy that? And so they started yeah. to measure it. You know, it's like, do we do two 20 person rooms or do we do five, four person rooms? I don't know. Do you just take the rule of thumb from the architect or with people counting that's out there or how, however you want to do it? Why don't you measure it? And and if you're collecting that granular data, why don't you, you you could get exact meeting room requirements per department per floor? And yeah, for this particular, we need seven seat rooms. For this other one, we need like two four seaters and and a twenty four seater because they they always overbook that space and the people counter is is over capacity. They're always wheeling extra chairs in. I. I I love that idea of like getting yeah. data driven deployment information out on the table. So that serves the the planning needs, right? That's a planning yeah. metric. You can use data 
from what you described, I think it was correlating a room being booked, the the occupancy level of that room, you know, both, you know, what its limit is, as well as potentially the live data of how many people were using it from a space planning perspective. Yeah. This is interesting because yeah. we're just hearing these different channels of how do you use these these pieces of data, live operational, planning for potential future upgrades. How else can we? Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I want to make a quick comment about the people sensing because that's a that's a great occupancy is an incredibly valuable metric, uh, especially in a distributed work from anywhere world. Uh, yeah. It was actually it was a considerable part of my work at. Uh, at VMware during my stint there um, was all focused on on uh, a, a lot of it was focused on uh, building you know sensing systems right and things like that and, and trying to trying to measure traffic of people and that was of course at the time really focused around COVID-19 and trying to manage uh, occupancy requirements and social distancing and can we enforce this with people counting and you know should we put you know do we put signs outside of rooms that that you know turn red if it's too full and turn green if it's not full enough or you know, that there's a vacancy available etc that was really fascinating work and I what I found was the big uh value that I found was really on the real estate planning side, like you just said, Jim. If we can say that this room is supposed to have five and we are gonna measure over time how many people are in that room, right? Then we are gonna get a really good idea if we are providing the right type of space. We're also gonna get a good idea as to how often that size of space is used and to what capacity yes. so that's your utilization percentage yes. right so is the five yes. person room being used and is it being used at maximum percentage ideally you want like all of your rooms to be used at like 80 plus percent right if you got some that are used like and utilized to 80 plus right uh so at least 80 plus percent uh full ideally because that means users are blocking their you know booking the right spaces etc um so the other the other thing that uh, we started digging into then was now what happens if you overlay the time series occupancy information with mm -hmm. the room schedule? Mm -hmm. so you start comparing time series occupancy information, not occupied or vacant. I mind you, like don't go grab a you know like an on off sensor and an, an occupied not occupied or really it's more motion detected not motion detected. Mm -hmm. Believe me, I have been down that. <laughs> path i have put hundreds of sensors out there in the world it sucked it sucked it was always a nightmare it was always a nightmare the best product and this isn't you know we're a dealer but so we, so we can kind of say it but uh like the best thing i found has been density by far when it comes to counting humans anonymously because they put that sensor over the doorway and all it does is count silhouettes and it's got a really right. good understanding of how many how many humans are in the space if you treat the space as a fluid body right so what we found really quickly is that with really accurate time series occupancy information laid against the schedule of the room we could find some fascinating things we could mm -hmm. tell uh we could tell if meetings started on time we could tell if they started on time Brilliant. and everybody showed up on time Brilliant. or if people showed up early or late not who showed up but we could tell Right. Oh, there was one person on time, then three people came into the room, then four more people came into the room, right? And you can start to build, hey, let's presume that we couldn't start the meeting waiting for these people. Then we're able to measure the amount of time in that meeting that you wasted money as an organization. Yeah. And this is what and this it, is going to be the key point here, I think. Yeah. Right. If you've got that bit of information, that is that is so critical. And it's not just that, right? Because now like overlay that with, uh, you know, how many, uh, did anyone show up, right? We're going to get some automation involved there. If nobody showed up, nobody's in the room and there's a meeting going on, free the space up. This is not a new concept, but you can start doing automation automatically to try and do those things. Uh, so there's a lot of occupancy related tasks. If you have time series information about the room's occupancy and you have the room schedule, there's a ton of interesting stuff you can do with that. And it only, I'm going to add one more layer to it. Now overlay that with your incidents as an IT operations team. 
So now we can actually see an incident occur. We had an incident reported in this room. We know that the incident was reported at this time. Mm. And we can see that there were X number of people in the room at reporting time or shortly before. And we can see as long as that incident was active, how many people were in and out of the room? How many people did that incident affect? potentially if that is an outage if that's a down tv if that's people coming into the room and the room didn't work so they all left and went to a new room right you can start to actually quantify with some intelligence quantify the amount of money that outages cost you mm. and that is the holy grail for all systems integrators and all customers for that relationship because now we can actually go to value-based pricing well, right. I'm going to stop it there. I'm going to roll that back for a second. But that's that's the holy grail, right? If we can actually know how much money we're saving with support services or with certain with working AD systems, then we can justify the expense of them yeah. as but ROI. It, it might not even be outages, right? It could just be stumbling with technology because isn't that what Gartner's put that out where the oh, across, you know, measured over thousands of companies, the first 10 minutes of any one hour meeting is spent trying to set up the technology yeah. and that's 17 17 percent of the meeting is that's is that not, plugged in a, it, yeah that's not a failure of technology right that's that's just failure of adoption right. could be cultural it, right it, people it, showing up late to meetings meeting. yeah there's yeah. a design yeah right because it could be design i, I mean yeah. <laughs> well, there's some cool experiences but i, I mean we've we've uh need some really great design professionals uh from a user experience perspective in the industry and can always bring in more because so user I mean, experience workflow is really tough for a lot of end users you've touched on so many things right here though like that's one slice of it where assuming everybody shows up on time when the meeting starts and then it still takes 10 minutes to you know really engage i'd be interested to see how you could quantify that that data, right? Because everybody's there. How do you know if something's not happening? How do you know if that the first 10 minutes of that room is that is that something that you can collect automatically? Or is that user feedback that's providing that input for you know the first 10 minutes of all so, meetings? I'm not sure we can today, but what I will say is when I pay my Toyota payment and I do it on their app, they track every button push so they are able to say i i see that you entered in the right amount yeah. but i also see that you didn't swipe submit all the way across the board and that's why your payment didn't go through so i'm not sure that av industry is taking advantage of it but they could and so if your meetings aren't starting for 10 minutes why don't we roll back the the, the videotape on that user interface where you're pressing HDMI one, but your laptop, we had video sense on HDMI three. So Interesting. Is it a user, yeah. is it a user error? Is it a user interface? Not well laid out error. There, there's a lot. There's a yeah. lot that can go into it. And, and that's referred to as APM. So this is application performance monitoring. And this is a fairly, I mean, this is a standardized just like you just said, right? When when you make your car payment, right? This is how every all of the big websites work. All the e-commerce sites, you better believe it's how Amazon works, right? They know how long you spend yes. doing whatever you're doing, yes. and they can start to build. They can start to build, um, you know, a, a meaningful story. You know, uh, as far as you know, can, can we quantify that this is a, a the user's experiencing an issue at this time, right? By based on hesitation or based on, you know, no sync on needed, right? Or whatever it might be. Uh, or are they trying to join a meeting and they continue to like to join, to try to join a meeting four times, right? Or whatever it might be. Like they've rejoined the same meeting ID multiple times in a row or, you know, any of those kinds of things. We basically just need to start building a profile. Yeah. Uh, and again, we're, we're talking about work, and this is very focused on workplace, right? It's workplace AV and we're basically getting into the nitty gritty of, how do you how do you quantify that the investment um the investment in your audiovisual real estate right is worthwhile and i think it's interesting i'm going to call out something that uh uh christopher blackburn put into the chat this is fast this is a fascinating comment uh the, the comment was that will depend on how your financing department calculates or doesn't calculate 
uh, loss of time. I've previously presented some uh, previously been presented some really compelling financial data about downtime and was told that uh, yeah, we don't calculate losses in that way. Thank you for popping it up there, Jay. So Whoa. yeah, so so great, right? And and maybe there's something to be said about uh, providing the raw data and then maybe letting organizations plug in their own metrics that feed the financial calculations, right? So what is the average salary of your employees, right? Uh, what is the, you know, being able to tune that to the organization itself so that they can start to, you know, take the raw data and do something with it. Certainly, I think we could provide a methodology. Um, yeah, I, I, I would say it's, it's, it's fascinating and I think we could prove it with the right data. But if, like we said at the beginning, if you don't have the right data, just another guy with an opinion. And even yeah. if you do have the right data, sometimes you're still just another guy with an opinion and some data. So it can be a challenge regardless. I mean, it all depends on your customer. Yeah, Christopher, yeah. that sounds fascinating. Can I just yeah, take yeah, a yeah. second and applaud Mr. Jeremy L. Cesar at, at the at, at the DJ booth for, for being able to put up that comment live? Yeah, that, that was great. As awesome, I'm reading man. it. Thank you. Thank Dude, you. That, that was totally right. unprepared. Well done, Fred. We got some new tools that we're we're Fantastic. bringing to the table these days. Pretty excited. They're like real streamers. Awesome. I didn't, well, yeah, and, I didn't mean to derail the conversation. But no, was, you're okay. fine. I actually wanted to throw up something else that Christopher uh, put up in the chat related to outcomes, but to kind of tee that up, right? We've been hitting on, you know, operational data. We've been hitting on planning data, you know, how to use data to influence or impact, you know, planning. Now we're talking about total cost of ownership because that's, for me, that's the always the question that I'm asking myself. How can we answer this for our customers? How can we tie the success of their AV systems, the technology, how are we deploying technology within their environment that's helping deliver on their specific business outcomes, right? And being yeah. able to, and it seems like room usage efficiency and, and utilization, like that's the, 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 the I'll, I'll say kind of unified set of information that can apply to a lot of for-profit businesses. But let's think about higher education for a second and kind of come back to come back to how do we really take analytics and be able to answer the question with math, with numbers, with data, are is your investment into this technology mm -hmm. helping you deliver on your mission, on your your vision as an organization. And so I'm going to throw up what Chris put into the chat here because it's incredible. For higher ed, we need data that can help us draw conclusions between classroom data and learning outcomes while maintaining privacy, right? How can we build a data set that ties learning capabilities, learning outcomes improved, hopefully, tied to the experience that that student has in the classroom, right? Corporate training, any any training, any knowledge transfer, I think when you have that type of activity going on really falls into this place. And, you know, he goes on to say, AV is in a unique place to collect this, this room data. You guys, I think, have both just articulated some of the technologies necessary to bring that to bear. But again, you can collect that data on, on, utilization on occupancy on scheduling on all of those things how are we then taking a totally un and I, I shouldn't say unrelated but taking a totally different set of data learning outcomes and correlating it back to our metrics that we are gathering i mean to me that's the holy grail of feeling like the investment feeling like the technology is serving a, a greater need you know a greater purpose within the organization yeah you know chris well, thanks I, for that comment because i think from a higher okay. education like that's he or she that can answer that question um stands to uh provide a lot of really good informative insight for learning technology and design but, but I think that this is why AV Analytics is so exciting because just like Chris said, AV systems are uniquely positioned for, for capturing this data and for presenting this data to the, the, the larger 
team of stakeholders, you know, and everyone thinks, okay, we, we put a display up on a wall. You guys are cute, but we, we don't really get brought to that, like kind of big britches table, you know, with, with the architects, with the general contractors, we're still just, just AV guys down at the back. But if we start to bring, um, just a different level of conversation to the table. If we start to, through our service data, through our, our customer support of deployed systems, through our analytics of that, if we're start to be able to um, guide deployment conversations, if we start to be able to guide return on investment conversations, retention uh, information, that that's why in the teaser we, we were talking about that is will elevate the industry it might not even elevate well it can it elevate the industry but it can also um provide another service offering consultancy offering to av service providers because someone's got to collect the data someone and it's it's not a matter of just collecting it like like we kicked it off someone's got to crunch those numbers interpret the data is it is it causation is it correlation what 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 can we learn from this data but the av industry is is poised to take advantage of that in a, in a big way yeah sounds like so, there's a lot of shuns available in that yeah. particular yeah lots of shuns so okay um a lot of thoughts rolling through my head right now from everything you guys have just said. And so I'll try to be concise and, and get right to the point. Um, there are some things that we could measure and provide back in a sort of vacuum as far as AV performance information, uptime, SL, those kinds of things, right? the operational data. But when you want to start tying value performance for the activity that's occurring in the space, right? Learning retention, um, you know, event satisfaction, uh, you know, take any anything that would be a business level concern, right? Like let's let's throw all the AV out the window for a minute. Let's stop thinking about it as systems integrators. Let's swing all the way back around and think about it as a customer and think what data would help me move my business forward, right? Let's go customer first here, customer centric. So uh, you're gonna wanna know you know, uh, yeah, like is uh, is my service effective? Is my product effective, right? If you're a live events professional or live events house or rental house, right? You're going to want some kind of satisfaction around your events, right? And and investment around those spaces, whatever it might be. Uh, if you're an education professional, right? Uh, you're going to want to tie some level of data from the AV performance side to grades and attendance and business level, or in this case, education level information so that you can start to see correlation, right? You're gonna actually be able to start bringing all that information together. And this is where I start getting excited because this is not, this is not in a vacuum stuff. AV really likes its, its solutions to sit in the box, right? Uh, that's not what this is. This is big data. This is big data analytics. This is data science. This is business analysts, right? Uh, this is a very different thing. And all we really are here, unless some people are going to go through massive transformation, we are a source. And our job in this case is to provide the raw data to a data analytics resource, a team within that company in a standardized, consumable, and normalized format. Because once they have the data, the time series data about whatever those factors are, all they're going to do is they're going to throw all that into their data lake, right? It's all time series correlated entries, and then they can start to analyze for patterns, right? Big cloud data, anal data analytics for patterns. We can provide some basic stuff, but like we're never going to get classroom grades, right? We're never going to get individual uh, performance mm -hmm. from individual uh you know students right or anything like that maybe if you're working in the in the uh university you might be able to start but that stuff's you know protected right that's not the widely available information so in my mind i think it's the av professionals job to get that application performance monitoring data to get that utilization data uh and to ensure that it's making it into the data set for consideration uh, for your data science professionals or your business analytics professionals. 
because if the data is not there, you're not a part of the decision. You're not a part of the informed calculation. So that would be my, that'd be my takeaway from this is that, I mean, I do think every AV professional probably needs to start hiring a data scientist or a business, a data scientist and, or likely both a business uh, analyst who understands how to correlate data and business value and to visualize it and to start transforming that because we have a lot of data in our hands, but I, we can't do it alone. Yeah. Well, and, and I'll challenge that. I'll, I'll challenge that a little bit because in in my opinion you know we we could feed the machine or we could uh use the machine as a service and still own that relationship you know if, if for, for for me th there are some concerns about the longevity of the, the the av industry with how things are moving and people might take it over devices are getting smaller systems are getting easier and so what happens to to the integrator if we own that conversation if we own that relationship <laughs> sorry Jim. dare you chris I'm gonna undercut How your point here dare you? <laughs> oh. nailed it thanks chris <laughs> sorry sorry jim please continue please continue pay but no attention if we develop partnerships with data scientists and we own those conversations with the clients, you know, certainly for 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 what, what Chris is talking about for grades and, and correlating um, uh, enrollment and, and everything like that for, for a higher ed, for, for sure, someone else can own that. That's kind of at our, out of our wheelhouse. But for deployment, for architectural, for, for general contracting conversations, if we own that data and lease out some data science partners, to feed us back that data, then we maintain that relationship. We maintain that that conversation, and we stay at that at that table. I don't know. It, yeah, I mean, so it, I, you know, <laughs> for, for for me, the, the the value is who owns the conversation. You know, who who does the work? That that you know, in in today's world, that's who, whoever wants it, whoever can do it, but where the the service offering is is who owns that conversation and i don't think it matters who does the work it's it's who wants to to own that relationship who wants to own that conversation yeah yeah i'm gonna jump right on christopher's other comment here Jay, if you want to throw that up not all uh, AV, av guys are sweaty by the way chris and and i think that's where i'm stuck is that there's a huge community of data science professionals that are taking in telemetry data from thousands of different sources. And we are just one of them. Now, if we can get the right data, like we're not going to own the data analytics conversation for a customer, right? Unless we are in ourselves turn into data analytics professionals who have those competencies and have access to the raw data needed. I think we could provide a lot of really good base data about AV application performance about system performance, things that are 100% in our domain, right? We could build, I mean, there's why, why aren't there white papers? Why isn't there an industry report, right? On this one thing, right? What are, you know, from from Avixa, right? Even at that, at that level, getting the right data across, you know, in a unified capture method so that we can start to say, here, here's really what performance looks like. Here's maybe what performance looks like across brands. Here's what performance looks like when you compare it across integrators. Here's what, you know, like shine the light on the whole thing, right? Um, there is a lot of data information that we can provide. And I totally agree that we want to, that's not a reactive conversation, right, Jen? That's that's what you know. That's a proactive conversation. We go in with the data to support us. We go in with the tools, right? We go in with the, the dashboards and the charts and the raw data, and we can have those educated conversations and show people. Um, I, I might just be jumping too far down the path, right, Jen? Because I think that's my next inevitable step is, yeah, like I, I almost want to hire, like I almost want to partner with a data analytics firm or insource some data analytics professionals and some business intelligence professionals and transform the entire thought process, which we've been talking about for a long time, into this is not AV. This is workplace technology, yeah. right? When you're about. dealing with a workplace technology level, we, our skills are one important part of that. You got to start surrounding yourself with some really smart people because workplace technology is a broad thing. You bring that together, you've got a winning combination 
from a, a team perspective in the workplace. And I think you could do the exact same thing in education technology, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. A different team, a different set of experts, a different service, but those two things to just be the, you know, go out there, be, in, be the gartner of the space, right? Start producing data and producing reports and showing with data the performance. There's a problem in getting the data. And that's the, the root issue is going to be really, it's really hard to draw this stuff out. Uh, but I, yeah, I, there's a tremendous value to the industry, uh, certainly. It's interesting. It sounds like we can get the data, at least the the data that our systems can provide, and obviously other data. I think, so. I think obviously other data, like grades, for example, or something that uh, unrelated to technology. Like you can gain these sources of data, but focusing on AV for a pers for for a moment. We've got the tool set to collect the data. We've talked about the fact that the monitoring tool set that gets the data from the device isn't necessarily where that data goes to live, either short-term or long-term, or even potentially to be correlated for analytics. Is that a fair statement? You know, is, yeah, is, mean, is the yeah. same tool that gets the data, the tool that stores the data and is able to export the data for, you know, maybe a data scientist to really correlate it against other data sets? Yeah, so it could be, it depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. um, what I would say is what you would, in my AV ignorance and in my research, what I found is you're gonna have data that lives in multiple places. The key is your ETLs. Right. Your key is your extract, transform, load operations. So you're going to take data from each of these point pools of data, and you're going to push them to your data lake, right, or your data warehouse. You're going to push them somewhere centralized where they can be correlated by in the cloud, away from your systems. Because when you're in your monitoring system, all you really care about is metric history and like trend data, right? Real basic stuff, up, down, alerts, open tickets, down, right? That's very, very real time. But when it comes to what it needs to do from there your next step is to say well, okay well now we're going to go push this to you know to snowflake right or to you know any other big data warehouse platform out there we're going to start pushing that to our customer and say hey this is a service we offer we can correlate all the data from your entire environment and push it to your data lake so you can do something with it and here's the you know here's the uh the schema that we're going to use so you understand what to do with this information right so that's what you're really going to end up with your big data analytics view on it, right? Is when it gets correlated with other data in a data warehouse, what we see as an isolated segment, yeah, we, we can do that when we can pull those reports right off the monitoring tool if it has the capability or through a, a third party, uh, you know, data tool, you know, Power BI or something like that, talking to the database directly and building some reporting. Uh, but the, the real goal is to get that data loaded out, you know, ETL'd out to a to a big data solution that data scientists can then work with. And then wait for the question that Jim wants them to ask you, which is, hey, that's a great idea. Can you guys do it for us? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, how do we get any industry trends if we don't all work off the same data and the same schema and the same, there's no standards here. Uh, so it'd be very interesting to try and do any kind of correlation on performance. You're going to have to do it in a in a bubble. It's just you, right? You can only deal with your data. I think the big picture, you know, the world I want to live in, right, is well, how? Where's the third party analyst firm for the workplace industry that aggregates, that goes to these integrators individually, goes to end user customers, right, and start saying, hey we want to start building trend information or whatever it might be. We want to, you know, we want, we want your data, right? Or we'll pay you for it or whatever it might be, but to start pulling that data in so we can, as an industry, start to see what does this world actually look like? Because we have a lot of assumptions about it. We have very little data about it. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I want to partner. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I want to partner with that that data analytics third party group, right? And help shape the industry around what is the standard method of that data capture and data movement because without, you know, some level of of being able to get some consistency like you said from data points 
across the industry that uh, that firm, that that initiative, that vision can't come to be. But how amazing would it be to partner with that type of a organization and help define what that standard is and see it get established and and implemented across the industry? I think that's pretty exciting. Not to yeah. say that like data and monitoring is super exciting, but I think it's super <laughs> exciting. No, but it, it, yeah. it's where it could take us. It's where it could take us as as an industry. It's where it could take us as thought leaders, as 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 early adopters, and 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 where it could take us in the eyes of our construction trade partners. Uh, I'm really excited about it. Whoo! Well, <laughs> yeah. That's a, yeah. I I I think that's an exciting and and an appropriate time to close. Um, definitely lots of food for thought. I I, I want to thank everyone for joining us and 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 Chris. I I think you get the MVP this evening. So absolutely I appreciate you, man. It's great to see your 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 name. Um, and yeah, Fred, Jeremy, thank you again. Let us know if you guys are going to to Infocom. We would we would love to see you. We'd we'd, we'd love to meet you and and see you in real life. Shake some hands, uh, and and please, if you're watching this on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on YouTube, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Yeah, can't awesome. wait to see everybody at the show next week. Really, yeah, I'm right into it. Make sure to come to yeah, Gemini's buddy. talks, if, especially if you want to talk about data and monitoring and data collection. Those are the two you're going to want to hit for sure. Yeah, we'll get freaky I, with it. I, I hear there's a lake involved, so be prepared <laughs> to get wet or, or something. <laughs> See you all later. Awesome. Very good. All right. Have a good, Have a good one, everyone.